the meeting, but uh, members will vote on those two things. We'll have a, a, a brief discussion about the budget if warranted, and then, and then we'll vote today. December 5th, which is next Sunday, holiday fellowship dinner immediately after the morning worship service. Meat, drinks, silverware, and plates will, pre will be provided. Uh, just need to bring yourself and a dish to share. And there's always some of us, and I've been guilty of this, forget to bring a dish, and that's okay if that happens. There will be plenty for all next uh, Saturday or next Sunday, December 5th. December 6th, which is the next day at 6 p.m., Secret Sister Reveal. And I don't know what that means, but I don't need to. I'm not a secret sister. Uh, but those of you that are will know what that means at the Acapulco restaurant in Xenia. Okay? All ladies are welcome. Any questions, see Faye Birch or Jody Howard, and they can get you filled in if you want to participate in a, in a fun evening on December the 6th at the Acapulco in Xenia. December 19th at 9 o'clock, Sunday School Youth Breakfast at the Annex. And I'm sure there's going to be... Uh, uh, Ego waffles abounding uh, at that. All right. Um, on December 19th, Sunday school breakfast at the Annex at 9 o'clock. December 24th at 5:30. I think that's on a Friday, right? This year. Okay. December 24th, Christmas Eve candlelight service. All are welcome. 5:30. Uh, it's it's dark at that time. We'll have the candlelight service. It's it's a brief service. It doesn't last long, but it's always enjoyable. Uh, candlelight service December 24th, December 29th through January 9th, back here behind the back door, I'm assuming is where it'll be, is the uh, mitten tree, and we'll be collecting hats and gloves for the Greene County Health District, and I know they appreciate that, and they go to needy children in our community. So mitten tree will start, uh, Faye does that December 29th through January 9th, so if you can pick up some mittens or gloves, hats, knit hats, those will all be appreciated. Any other announcements? No? In preparing for Thanksgiving this week, I came across a verse, Psalm 107-1, that pretty well sums up Thanksgiving in a few short words. Psalm 107-1 says this, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Good morning. This week Roger texted me and asked me if we wanted to sing some Christmas songs. And I said, sure. And he said, how about Grandma got ran and play a reindeer? And I said, no. <laughs> so we're gonna, we are going to sing some Christmas songs this morning. Um, our first song this morning is Joy to the World.
next song this morning is What a Beautiful Name. <clears throat>
every week we gather around for the Lord's Supper, and it's just a time for us to uh, remember what Christ has done for us on the cross and also to reflect on uh, how we lived for him in the past week and uh, where we may have fallen short. Um, I think uh, Second Corinthians 5, or uh, Philippians 2, uh, 5 through 11 has an important message for, uh, for us to remember as we take communion. So it says, in, in your relationship with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So I think uh, this passage uh, shows us that, um, uh, just kind of highlights the sacrifice that Jesus made where he um, humbled himself by becoming human and then also um, died on the cross for us. And um, I think we can just have that in mind as we take the Lord's Supper and um, just let us pray. Dear God, thank you for um, sending Jesus to come um, take on the nature of a human and uh, live uh, life on earth so that um, we may have a person to model after. And we also just thank you for um, his sacrifice that he made. And we just ask that you would help us to uh, convict us uh, during this time and show us uh, how we failed to live up to your expectations and then also um, we just ask that you could use this time to um, allow us to repent for that and um, make sure that we can live the next week uh, for you. That's in your son's name we pray. Amen.
Good morning. The uh, elementary age kids can be dismissed to go downstairs with Caleb Sherritt this morning. <clears throat> I hope you all had a uh, great Thanksgiving. I know we did. We had safe travels, good turkey. What more can you ask for? Uh, one of the things is after, um, sort of after the meal was officially over, I forget exactly who it was. We we're all sitting around, and it's one person in my family. It was one of the kids. I don't know if it was one of my kids or one of my nieces declared, "Well, Thanksgiving is officially over." Now the turkey had not been digested, even digested partway at this point. Put on some Christmas music. So, all right. So right now, even though it's not even December first yet, most of us have shifted to this idea of like we are in the Christmas season right now. And basically, as soon as it's November first in Walmart and Target, it's the Christmas season. So we're kind of into it. Uh, we've already listened to a lot of. <laughs> 10-hour drive, two ways to Delaware. I've listened to a lot of Christmas music already. And one of the things I think about Christmas, it is a season of anticipation, especially for kids. Now, I realize, sadly, that, like, the peak kid's anticipation for Christmas, and here's what I mean, the countdown to know exactly how many days they, until school is out. You know what I'm talking about, that countdown. The exact number of days until Christmas morning, down to the exact day. The not being able to fall asleep on Christmas Eve, the waking up at ridiculously early hours in the morning, all that. My kids have, we're, we're at the tail end of the peak. Maybe it's past, but it's, there's, it's, they are so excited about Thanksgiving. And I thought to myself, what, what are adults as excited about in their lives as kids are for Christmas morning. And actually, oh, I'm, I'm not sure, so I looked up a little art, couple articles. One was from CNN, and you know, I don't usually uh, read CNN articles, but I know Eric Hickman, that's one of his favorite websites, so I looked it up. <laughs> I looked up 21 things to look forward into 2021, and guess what? I'm like, I don't even know what most of these things, and I don't care. So I clicked on to the next article that says, 50 things to look forward to in your life. And it kind of expands the entirety of your life from uh, the time you're a kid to the time you die. And I looked, I'm like, well, 35 of these I've, I've already in my past, and most of them are way in my future. I'm not making a bucket list right now. I hope I'm not a grandfather anytime soon. And so maybe only one to five in the next couple of years is one that might even apply to me. So I'm like, oh, well, there's not as much... It's hard to be as excited as about things as kids are about Christmas. It is a season of anticipation. I mean, we have these mini anticipation events. Uh, my favorite TV show, there's a new episode coming on tonight. For me this week is I'm like, I can't wait till the Ohio State-Michigan game. It's going to be a good one this year. It's like, oh, yeah, so much for anticipation. Why did I? Sometimes the things we anticipate let us down. And so uh, there's anticipation, but for parents... Uh, there's a countdown of, of sorts. There's a, a, a there's, it requires preparation as well. Uh, five years ago, ten years ago, uh, I would have been angry at my future self because I thought the idea of uh, shopping on Black Friday or even Thanksgiving Day itself would have been like, I mean, it sort of it doesn't make sense to me in the past. So I'm like, I'm being thankful, but now I'm immediately going to buy more stuff, maybe more stuff to be thankful for at that point. But it, it, it sort of didn't resonate with me. But I realized, look, um, I'm going to buy this stuff anyway between now and December 24th. And so I might as well get it now when it's on sale. And besides that, when it comes to the preparation for the Christmas season, all of you know that the shipping containers that contain all the stuff that you want to buy for Christmas are where? In the ocean off the coast of California, Long Beach, right? Can't get it so, and if you go into Walmart and go into the stores and look at the different things, it's all gone, isn't it? So I'm like, well, I better get started now because, because my kids are anticipating Christmas, we have to be prepared. Now, if you look at what the birth of Jesus, Christmas has always been, it's always carried with it a sense of anticipation. I want us to think about it for God's people here. Um, it started back in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve sinned against God, and uh, 
God tells Satan about what will happen in the future. In Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And so uh, virtually at the beginning of time itself, after they sinned, however long they were in the Garden of Eden, before they sinned, as soon as they had chosen to disobey God, God says, I'm going to do something through the offspring of one of these human beings who you have helped fall, Satan. I'm going to do something that's going to set this world to rights. It's going to neutralize your ability to impact them anymore. You fast forward hundreds of years to Abraham. Abraham in Genesis 22, 18 is told, And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Again, he's saying through your line, Abraham, we're narrowing it down to his line. There's going to be a uh, people are blessing. And it's very vague if you look at this promise. I don't know that they would have connected the dots between uh, Genesis, uh, the beginning of Genesis and the middle of Genesis that is talking about Jesus. But they have this idea something is coming uh, that's going to set the world back to the way God wanted it to be. In Deuteronomy 18, 18 uh, 15, it's more specific. God says to Moses, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And then you get the Old Testament prophets who drop clues about the Messiah. You find bits and the pieces of the writing of Hosea, Isaiah, uh, Daniel, Zechariah, Malachi. Even the Psalms have some messianic uh, prophecies. But the idea is someone is coming from God who's going to fix uh, what is wrong with the, God's people, the people of Israel, and even the world. It's going to turn around everything that has gone wrong in this, uh, since the beginning of time. Our sin, rebellion, our, our, our gap between us and God. And... Uh, if, if you had all those promises from God over the span of thousands of years, what question would you probably ask? Well, when's this going to be? When's this going to be? And maybe a little bit of how this is going to be. It had to feel like a long time coming for the people of Israel. And, and, and their experience of waiting... For something to happen for thousands of years is something we can't relate to. But uh, it, it caused me to think of God's relationship with time. God has known all along what the plan was going to be to redeem human beings. And so it's controversial as to how God uh, thinks it, well, not thinks about time, relates to time. Here's what we know for sure God is eternal meaning he has no beginning and no end. He has always existed. We can say that with confidence uh, from the Bible. He also has foreknowledge, which means uh, he knows uh, accurately what's in the past, what's in the past, the present, but also what's in the future. All right. In which way he has bound himself to space and time, we don't know for sure. That's (laughs) My brain starts to smoke and whir when I think about that. It's... You can't completely comprehend God, but some people think he experiences time in some way with us, but uh, the thing that I want to point out is before he created us, and Ephesians 1 talks about before the foundation of the world, before he created us, he knew we were going to sin. He created the world with the consequences it would have, and he knew exactly how he was going to redeem human beings. Uh, And Ephesians 1, 3, and 4 say this, They say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. Now this is not talking about God saying, you know, I'm going to save this person, not that, not that person arbitrarily, but it's talking about a group of people, Christians, those who believe in Jesus. He said, I knew what I was doing with that before the foundation of the world. But the fact of the matter is, the, what did they know and when did they know it? For human beings, it was not until Jesus was actually born, and still most of the people missed it, how God was planning through all these promises to redeem people 
from the world. And as God's people, the Israelites, while God knew, they'd been waiting for thousands of years for the arrival of this one person. And they were expectantly waiting for a long time. But if you think about the Christmas story, they are not the only ones who are waiting expectantly for God to redeem human beings and to set the world and this creation to right. I want you to imagine in your mind's eye the, uh, the manger scene. Has anyone set up a, does, anyone, does everyone have a manger scene that they put up in their house? We have one little, we had a little people one for a while. I think we, we have one now. We set it up and so kind of on the uh, right side, what do you, who do you usually have? Wise men usually on that. I feel like wise men are always on the right side. On the other side is what? I always thought Mary, Mary Joseph meant what? Animals. Animals are kind of in the middle. It's like they're mingling with Jesus. Shepherds on the other side. Then up above, just kind of hanging out is what? The angels. And I began... What's that? You don't have mine? I feel like they're always there. I don't know. I've only had one or... I, I don't pay that much attention to it. but So the angels are present, and, and definitely in the stories of the birth of Jesus. In fact, there are 177 references in the New Testament alone to angels, and over 208 times in the Bible as a whole they're talked about. And so I want to, so after we talk about who and what they are for a little bit, I want us to talk about what it was like to be Gabriel uh, in the events leading up to the first Christmas. Um, I find I find uh, the information that is out there about angels to be interesting. Um, there's a lot of uh, weird stuff out there, honestly, weird things, non-biblical things. People think about angels, which has kind of turned me off. And for years and years, I kind of threw the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. So I just want to spend a couple of minutes, uh, since they, I, 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 I listened to a sermon where um, it said the world of the Bible is a world with angels. We shouldn't minimize them just because some people have some odd ideas about them. So here's a couple just bullet points. The presence of angels is a reminder that there is another realm, a spiritual one, that is very real despite the fact that we can't see it. In our reality, there are beings that honor and serve God. And in that realm, there are beings that honor and serve God. There's also beings who dishonor and have rebelled against God. Uh, The Bible refers to an organizational structure with angels. Gabriel, who we're going to talk about in a little bit, is an archangel. There are different kinds of angels. There's cherubs. Someone said, uh, this, this kid looks like a cherub. He has a sweet little innocent looking face. When in the New, and in the Old Testament, cherubs were these guardians of the throne room of God who have animal features. There's seraphim, and then there's messengers. Someone asked me, uh, what does an angel look like? And I'm not really sure. What, well, the interesting thing, because we assume they have what sticking out their, back, their shoulder blades? Wings. Because we read about them flying, so we say, well, they've got to have wings. And the idea of an angel without wings kind of uh, doesn't fit with us. But no, nowhere in the Bible does it say they have wings. In fact, sometimes when people interact with angels in the Bible, they are not sure what, they are intera- what kind of being they are interact with. So there's a degree to which they look like people. Hebrews 13.2 says, Do not neglect to show hospitalities to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Meaning, hey, there's sometimes where you may be interacting with some guy on the street or someone you bump into uh, at the grocery store and it may be uh, not a human being at all. That that sort of thing is impossible to know. Some people were scared when they saw him and so the whole idea of wings and white robes is uh, something we've constructed. It's important to remember that angels are creative beings. I don't know when they were created but I'm going to assume that they were all created at the same time. I may be wrong about that. The Bible doesn't say for sure. And as we read Job 38, uh, it talks about when they would have been created. God asked Job, were you there when I laid the earth's foundation and all the angels shouted for joy? 
So they existed before us. They saw the creation in the world. Um, a, a scholar in the New Testament says, since they are created beings, angels are finite in every way. In no sense they, do they share God's infinity. They are limited with regard to space, time, knowledge, and power. And so when we think of how do they, like God's over here, and we're over here, and where are they on the scale? There may be a lot, the fact that they experience time and are not infinite, they're a lot more closer to us than maybe we initially think. And they worship God and give messages about him. And the, the, the important thing is that uh, about them is that they always point their worship to God. Now, Gabriel uh, is the angel announced Jesus' birth. Um, he's first mentioned in the Old Testament in the book of Daniel. God's people were exiled in Babylon, and one of the exiles was named Daniel. Most, we most famously remember Daniel for being in the lion's den, escaping, and for interpreting the king's dreams. Uh, but in chapter 8 of the book, named after him, Daniel had this dream he couldn't interpret that just sort of bugged him. Well, the solution was this. It says, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face, but he said to me, understand, O son of man, that the vision is for, is for the time of the end. And the book of Daniel, like the book of Revelation, can be very controversial in how you interpret it. Uh, but one way or the other, it is about Jesus and what he's going to do. So I started thinking about this. This happened 600 years before Jesus was born, when the people of God were in exile in Babylon. And I thought about, like, we've thought about God's people. What did they know and when did they know it? It's like they had bits and pieces, but they didn't know the specifics until Jesus was born. God knew it all along. But what about Gabriel? What did he know? How, in what way was he anticipating and preparing for Jesus' birth? And I think it's easy to assume that he knew what God's plan was all along. But throughout the Bible, and we're going to read 1 Timothy 3.16 here in a second... It talks about God's plan for the world in sending Jesus being a mystery. By its very nature, mystery is something that people don't know. In 1 Timothy 3.16, uh, Paul says, Great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of godliness. He, meaning Jesus, was manifested in the flesh. He was vindicated by the Spirit, which is a reference to his resurrection. He was seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on the world, and taken up in glory. I don't know that if we go back to thinking about Gabriel, if, if this is all a mystery, I don't know if he knew. We get to the Christmas story, uh, the first chapter contains of Luke that contains most of what we consider the Christmas story. It contains two birth announcements. The first is not even about Jesus, but foretells of the birth of Jesus' cousin, a prophet who had paved the way for the Messiah, uh, John the Baptist. And uh, he appeared to Zechariah, and it says, And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. And... Uh, Gabriel tells him, you're going to have a son. He's going to be a great prophet of God. I don't know if he knew he was the forerunner of the Messiah, but he knew he was going to be great. And Zechariah doubted the message. He said, My, I'm old. My wife is old. How is this going to be? And the angel answered him, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. Then uh, a little bit later, back in Nazareth, verse 26 of Luke chapter 1, it says, In the sixth month, after he made this announcement, 
Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, O favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled by the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you shall conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And his kingdom, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And I think for God's people, they must have... For those of them who understood it, they must have said, finally, it is here. God's plan is coming to fruition, is coming into the light. But I thought, Gabriel, how excited it was for him. I, I'm operating on the assumption that he didn't know the specifics, he, but, but he had known for thousands, at least hundreds, maybe thousands of years, God's going to fix what is broken with this world. And he's going to do it in this way, but I don't know the specifics. And finally he said, I'm showing up, and I get to be the one that announces that it's happening for this girl in Nazareth. There was a sense of, all right, my anticipation has finally uh, been met. My ex expectations by, has, has finally been met. And finally, it's over. And so as much as any of us celebrate, anticipate, and prepare for Christmas. Uh, not just, it just doesn't occur in our realm, but the heavenly realm as well. And there's a, a couple takeaways that we should uh, derive from this. <clears throat> One, if this is so something so big that heaven and earth are coming together, and has been in the works for thousands of years, even though we're looking at it in the rearview mirror, we need to make sure we don't miss it. And by it, I mean the real meaning of Christmas. That sounds obvious. How exactly could we miss it? Uh, there is an avalanche of stuff that we do around Christmas time, isn't there? We were driving back from Delaware, and uh, Jamie was uh, writing on our calendar the different things we had. I, said, I saw her writing on Thursday. I said, Thursday's our open night in our family. You're writing something on Thursday. What's Thursday? Well, then we got that Monday, and then we got that Tuesday. And that's Friday, and next week, and next week, and next week. Stuff with work, stuff with family stuff with friends, always, it's all very important. I'm not saying that we should just say we're not doing it. But we need to make sure we don't miss it, the real meaning. Uh, Christmas is largely treated as a uh, secular family holiday. Uh, and the economic activity around it drives the American economy. And so it's a challenge to stay focused on what, what we're really celebrating. It's easy to lose the forest for the trees. We have to think, who and what is pointing me to Jesus? It's nothing in the stores we're going to go to. It's nothing in the movies that we may watch that have to do with the season. Um, I saw several Hallmark videos that movies, not by my own choice, in the same room as uh, uh, during the Thanksgiving holiday. And as wonderful and heartwarming as those Hallmark video uh, movies are, do they have anything to do with Jesus, right? No. You listen to a lot of the music. It has nothing to do with who Jesus is. And so I'm not saying, hey, don't do any of those things. Those are fun things to do, traditions, part of our how we celebrate. But we cannot lose sight of the forest for the trees. We need to stay focused. The second takeaway is um, we have to realize, and the presence of angels in the Christmas story indicates this, that there is more to reality than what we can see and hear and taste and touch. 
there is, an, I would describe it as a parallel reality where the spiritual world can permeate our natural world. And when an angel shows up and says, you're going to have a baby, and then shows up six months later and says, you're have a baby, that's uh, one world going into another. That nature of reality, that there is a world that we can't see with beings that both honor God and don't honor God, uh, is easy to forget, or at least to not think about. But we're going to read 2 Corinthians 4 in a minute, uh, and it tells us that all the stuff that I can taste, touch, see, and smell, someday will be gone. But the reality that I can't taste, touch, smell, or see, which is just as real, is eternal. So it makes you think, well, if there's something temporary and something eternal, what should I focus my life on? 2 Corinthians uh, 4, 17 through 18 says, says this. It says, for this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, temporary. But the things that are unseen are eternal. The, the presence of angels in the Christmas story reminds us that there is this supernatural world that exists that can influence ours. And we should live with that understanding. Another takeaway is that we live in a time and we should celebrate it after the arrival of Jesus. For all the people that were wondering, what is God going to do before Jesus came? All the beings that were wondering, what is God going to do? We know. And we can enjoy the what Jesus has done for us. Think about it. 2,500 years ago, where were your ancestors? And how much did they know about God? My ancestors were... They were running around in a forest in Germany somewhere. And some other places, right? Did they know that there was a creator who loved them and provided for their physical needs? No. Did they know that... Uh, they may have understood on some basic level that they violated the will of this transcendent being, but did they know exactly what was sin and not sin? what the consequences of that were. They didn't know that. Did they know that this person a couple thousand miles to the east would, was God, would be God in the flesh and redeem them from their sins? And that all the uncertainty and ignorance that they had about, about God, they did, they, 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 we don't have to experience that. We know what God's word is. We know what God's covenant is with, with us. We know what God's plan is. And for God's people, uh, the, the Israelites, they knew how God really was. Because he became a, a human and showed us what he was really about. Now we know that God loves us unconditionally, that we don't need to earn his approval, and that uh, I simply need to come to God through faith in Jesus. Christmas still in the Christian life is also includes anticipation and preparation. So I think about uh, the way that Jesus came to earth the first time. Uh, Jesus, we assume, even as becoming flesh, could have come in any way he wanted to. He could have been beamed down, if he, I would say. He could have been beamed down if he wanted to. The fact of the matter is he came to a uh, town in Nazareth. Uh, that's where he grew up. He was born in Bethlehem, raised in Nazareth. 
Uh, Nazareth had a reputation for being a hillbilly small town. 150 people lived there, they think, when Jesus was born. I mean, it was the sticks. He's born of blue collar parents. Joseph was a carpenter. It seems like he died an early death. Mom was just an ordinary person. Then he came as a baby. Every time I hold a baby, I think, especially now, I have a, I have a 10-month-old nephew named Jonah, and I hold him, and, like, he barely knows who I am. All he really cares about is eating and sleeping, and that's about it, right? I think to myself, God became one of these, a baby boy. That's an interesting choice to make. We look forward to another coming of Jesus, a second coming. But it's not going to be like, oh, here's baby Jesus, no crying he makes. The Bible talks about him coming on a cloud, coming with a uh, on a white horse. It'll be undeniable because back when the first time he came, it's like a, people were not able to comprehend. I mean, this is how God is entering the world. It was so wild that most of them couldn't even believe it. But it'll be undeniable. In First Thessalonians five, it describes the return of Jesus. It says, "For the uh, for the Lord Himself will descend from heaven." with a cry of command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. It's going to be loud. People are going to know what it is. And because of the celebration of Jesus' birth, we get ready. And uh, for Jesus' to return, we need to get ready as well. The only th- we only know a couple things about Jesus' return. We don't know when it's going to happen. It'll happen like a thief in the night, and we should be prepared for it. And I thought, well, as we close, what exactly does it mean to be ready for Jesus' return. And there's, there's three things. One is from the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus said, the people that are ready for my return are those who realize that when they feed the hungry, clothe the naked, give a drink to the thirsty, and visit the lonely, they're doing it for me and in my name. And I will say to them, well done, good and faithful servant. Like if you want to get, what's the only specific thing that the Bible says about what it means to be ready for Jesus' return? It is feed the hungry, clothe the, clothe the naked, give a drink to those who are thirsty, visit the lonely. Be generous. The second part is tell others about Jesus. Jesus. We can, we're used to things expiring. If any of you did uh, Black Friday shopping, you know, like, this deal expires at midnight tonight. This email, this uh, deal expires at midnight tomorrow. Get it now because you don't have time. Once Jesus returns, our ability to say, you know what, to someone, we love you and we want you to know Jesus, that is over. So we need to tell them now. And the third is like, we just need to grow to become more like Jesus. Am I on the path to six months from now, I'll be more like Jesus than I am now? Six years, will I be more like Jesus than I am now? Uh, 16, 26 years. Am I becoming more like Jesus Um, And then would I be satisfied with the way I'm being shaped like him if he returned today? None of us are going to be perfect when he returns. Uh, I I, I don't know what we'll think when he returns, but there's part of us that's going to be like, I'm a little bit embarrassed that this is still going on in my life now. That's going to happen for everyone, right? no, No one will be perfect, but like... Are we tracking in which we're becoming more like Jesus because we know how much 
he loves us and because we love him and we're thankful for the gift that he's given us. And, and so I just hope that as we live our lives that we, and we celebrate Jesus' first birth, we can both anticipate, be excited about, and prepare for a second coming. But there's preparations to make. And so we're going to offer an invitation right now. And if you've not accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, we're going to invite you to come forward and accept him um, as the uh, king of your heart, Savior of your, uh, from your sins. The conditions for accepting it are this. This is how you accept it. First, you must believe in Jesus, uh, that he rose from the dead, that he can take away your sins. Then we ask that you'd make a public confession or profession of who he is. We'd ask someone, do you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God? Uh, the, it's concluded with becoming one with that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection in baptism. So we're going to stand and sing an invitation to him. And if you have that decision to make, come forward at any point while we sing, Lord, I need you. who lost his dad on the 17th. So we want to pray for 
uh, the Douglas family, and uh, you can check your prayer list for uh, anything else that was added during the week. Uh, just a reminder, uh, after I conclude prayer, uh, we're going to have a congregational meeting, and if uh, you're not a member and you want to stay, you're welcome to. Some congregational meetings, uh, there's a lot of yelling and uh, anger and uh, insults hurled. Our, our congregational meetings aren't like that. So if you're staying around for like one of those, you will, we hope you're dis I hope you're disappointed. Uh, but uh, if you want to come and see the, our yearly congregational meeting, sort of what we do to conduct business, you're welcome to stay in and watch it. It'll be fine. So let's uh, close in prayer. Dear God, we thank you so much for uh, each day of life that you give us and all the ways that you bless us. I just pray that you will uh, be, with, uh, be with us in every way. Uh, God, we're thankful so much that you sent your son to the earth to show us who you are and to redeem us from our sins. And I just pray that um, as we enter uh, this season where we celebrate that, that you will be with us and that our hearts and our minds will be clear and amidst all the busyness that we will uh, be focused on you. Help us to remember that you're returning, uh, not as a baby, but as the King of Kings, who you really are. And I pray that you guard our hearts and our minds and guide us so that we know who you want us to be between now and then. Uh, we thank you that you are returning to uh, finish what you started and set this world uh, into what it's, you created it to be, something that reflects your glory. Pray will be with those who are hurting uh, now. Pray will be with the Douglas family and their loss, that you will give them comfort uh, during their time of loss. We thank you for your son. In his name we pray. Amen.